good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. This is actually uh, a lot more people than I had expected for a, a topic so uh, specific. Uh, so I'm, I'm very glad to, uh, to see you all. I think it's good to start with uh, well, I've, I've brought a presentation which uh, might not be easily seen for everyone in the audience. I don't think that will be much of a problem. Uh, as you can see on the slide as well, uh, there's the name of my company. But I think in general it would be wise to say uh, that I intend uh, what I'm about to say tonight to be mainly uh, on my own uh, or because uh, uh, considering uh, the place that I'm invited to, I thought I would uh, make it a little. Uh, I thought I would make it a little more political this time than I would usually do. I think the word yeah, this is better. Right? Um, so um, and there's also another general remark which I think would be good to say beforehand that normally. Uh, I tend to get uh, a bit more technical uh, about the, the things that we've been doing our research on. Um, I think looking at the people around me I'll, uh, um, and, and having already spoken to some people, I'll try to not be very technical uh, tonight and uh, keep it more on a policy level. Luckily, um, I'm trained as a political scientist, uh, so I don't think it'll be a problem. I'm not. I'm not a very technical guy myself. I'm interested in, in policy issues in general, and uh, I think uh, those lend themselves to a discussion about uh, security, uh, cybersecurity, uh, very <coughs> actually. Um, because actually, well, it, uh, being a political scientist, I think uh, we are in a very political moment, obviously, when we're looking at, uh, at issues of cybersecurity. Uh, and that obviously uh, has come to the front most prominently in, uh, in the past six months with relation to uh, discussions about the possible hacking of, uh, of the United States elections. I think uh, that's, that's now the pivotal point at uh, which we are, which uh, makes, uh, makes the urgency of discussing issues of cybersecurity uh, at the forefront. Um, and security isn't a technical issue. Uh, the issue is about how much uh, time, energy, and money are you willing to spend as uh, as a government, as a political entity, I'm looking at the EU today. Um, but how much time, money, and effort are you willing to spend to uh, eliminate some of the risks associated with putting everything on the internet as a cybersecurity specialist, I'm quite skeptical about the way that we use technology and the way that um, uh, people are, uh, are always trying to put everything on the internet. I think there's a lot to be said for uh, sometimes taking second guesses about, uh, about everything uh, uh, that we're putting online, uh, trying to think, okay, should we do this? Actually, well, um, I'm from the Netherlands and we're having some interesting discussions at this very moment about making the election process itself, uh, making that electronic, uh, which in my opinion this is complete nonsense. But uh, these are discussions that are being had all over the world now. The idea usually being um, we can do something electronically, so why shouldn't we? There's some some vague idea of, of progress being associated with uh, um, with doing that, uh, with um, implementing um, uh, new and innovative ways of handling things. And I think we should be quite careful about the way we approach uh, technology in that way. If we look at the uh, election cycle in the in the United States, I think um, the. The interesting, most prominent thing that we've seen is that uh, there was nothing very new about uh, what was going on there. Uh, everybody uh, who has any knowledge about cybersecurity has known for years that the primary uh, states that are doing a lot of uh, a lot of hacking are uh, China, Russia, and the United States. Uh, everybody has known this uh, for a lot of years. Um, so. Um, 
if you approach new elections, I think one of the main things as a political entity should be to be aware of the fact that this is going to happen and how do you arm yourself. So looking at uh, the US election and the way that specifically the Democratic Party uh, in, in the United States approached cybersecurity where uh, they had practically none, even though they had a data operation that was worth billions of dollars, um, which was uh, uh, extremely advanced, or so they thought uh, afterwards. Uh, well, we could tell that actually uh, their data operation might not have been very advanced, but the main problem was obviously that uh, their cybersecurity uh, was, uh, was practically worthless. They had one or two people looking at the issue, <coughs> even after they were alerted by the FBI about the risks that they, uh, that they had and the fact that they, their email had been breached. Uh, nobody was doing anything uh, for months. So you see here that there is the, the main motivation and the main issue with cybersecurity is not its technical implementation, but it's the will uh, and the uh, policy urgency um, associated with the main actors in, in the democratic game, uh, where you know it's nice to focus on, on shiny things like how can we know exactly what voters are thinking, what's driving them, and all that sort of thing. That's where uh, politically usually the most capital is being uh, spent, and not on like the basics like, okay, how do we value the information that we have, and how do we keep it? Um, I think, yeah, th those are the most specific things actually I wanted to say with regards to <coughs> Uh, with regards to <coughs> these elections and, and the more general policy points, um, I wanted to devote the rest of, of the talk to the more broader point of um, how uh, within Europe uh, cybersecurity is being addressed. And, uh, and I'd be interested uh, afterwards to discuss how that relates to, um, to uh, the Argentinian uh, situation, for instance, and also developments in the coming year, because I do actually think that um, we are at a pivotal uh, moment right now. I mean, the, these election hacks have made it abundantly clear that, uh, um, that a, lot, uh, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot more attention should be paid to cybersecurity. And I think also the fact that um, President Trump in the United States has aggressively promoted a America first uh, strategy um, also gives us some things to thought of, uh, to think about uh, with regards to how we use technology I mean at least looking at the European situation most technology comes from American companies like Microsoft and Apple um, so some of the things I'll be addressing later uh, address that very issue so the dependence on on these uh, greater technology firms poses a risk for other countries because um, these American companies are subject to American laws. Um, usually the equipment is made in, uh, in places like China where different uh, legal requirements uh, also are being met by these companies. So there's, uh, there's actually even more risk uh, developing for that. Um, so I think right now the the big uh, the big issue is coming for a lot of countries in the world. Where do we position ourselves once uh, all these countries are saying that actually the way that we use the internet, the way that we use technology, is very much uh, dependent on uh, which country is determining uh, where where the technology comes from and how it's being used. So if Google, for instance, is an American company, um, I'm, I'm sure their motto used to be, don't be evil. I think they've abandoned that motto for, for quite some time now. And it's very clear that they're very much entwined with a lot of political uh, interests. So um, in the coming years, it'll be interesting to see how far they still will cooperate with the American government 
strategy that is even more clearly than in the past directed at, uh, at American interests first. So I think that, uh, that is sort of the basis for my talk today and uh, I want to go specifically more into um, how cybersecurity within Europe and within our policy framework has been operating. So if, um, if we look at um, the EU and cybersecurity, um, historically actually there hasn't been a lot of uh, development um, with regards to uh, policy issues. I think one of the main things is that um, security in general within an EU context has been uh, uh, has been uh, a weak uh, a weak pillar, and that mainly has to do with the fact that uh, the member states of the European Union always like to keep any security issue close to their chest. They, they do not want to, uh, to share too much. Um, and also I think that in general cybersecurity used to be uh, quite an overlooked topic in general. Um, you can see actually in, in a broader context that in the past, in the past 10 years um, a lot of effort has been put into developing all sorts of uh, strategies. I think the first strategy of the United States dates from 2010 or 2011 and uh, the first time, and um, historically speaking, Europe will follow a few years later. Uh, so also in this case, in 2013, a first European cybersecurity strategy was uh, developed, um, but I think in, in a theme that we will see coming back in my talk, uh, it's, it's been mainly uh, concentrated on being a strategy and not too much action being uh, conferred with these strategic uh, initiatives. Um, one of the issues that actually Europe has been working uh, a lot and cooperating a lot on has been uh, their uh, cooperation on incident and threat detection. So basically, uh, this is one of the most important things within cybersecurity. Like I said, it won't be too technical, but basically, um, if you find out that there has been a significant breach, you want to tell people uh, around the world, and at least in friendly states, you want to tell them as soon as possible all the relevant information. Um, so, uh, actually, that's that's been one of the main things where the European Union has actually been really good and for a really long time in uh, developing mechanisms uh, with which they can alert other member states of uh, threats in the, in the digital domain. <coughs> um, one of the more important things uh, that's been more, one of the more important developments in the past couple of years has been the development of the Network Information Security Directive this directive. Uh, this is actually an, uh, an example of uh, where it's been actually been uh, the European Union has been quite uh, quite forceful in uh, developing a strategy that's aimed more at uh, protecting its uh, critical infrastructure. So uh, making sure that all the EU member states have uh, have a cohesive and uh, uniform approach how they uh, defend themselves against cyber attacks. Um, so that's been mainly at, for instance, the energy sector and the uh, water sector, telecoms, you know, the things that, without which our life uh, is basically now, uh, we cannot imagine our life to be anymore. Uh, these, these vital infrastructures um, are now so uh, incredibly dependent on, on information security and, uh, and also on cyber security. Um, I think one of the one of the historically one of the most important examples of this uh, has been the fact that uh, uh, Iran's nuclear uh, facilities have been attacked. This was already uh, I think in 2009. 
um, then a virus was developed, which was uh, developed specifically to attack the, the Iran's nuclear uh, facilities and uh, their, uh, uh, their centrifuges. Yes. So this program was uh, spread. The virus was spread all over the world, um, and it didn't do anything in all the computers that it infected. It only waited until it could hop on a USB stick, and then still it wouldn't do anything until it could hop from the USB stick to uh, to these uh, uh, nuclear plants. It's an incredibly ingenious uh, type of, uh, of virus. Um, I can recommend actually. There's a, a film has been made about uh, about how this thing works because I'm a bit short on time. But the story is really fascinating. So. I would recommend the documentary Zero Days uh, of last year, um, which explains in about one and a half hours uh, how much our vital infrastructures uh, are at risk, and specifically how everything we do now in modern life has become so dependent on computers that even uh, where you think that you've, uh, uh, you've protected them uh, pretty well, and there's always ways in which they can still be under threat. So that might be another interesting topic for discussion later on, actually. Um, but the uh, reason that I uh, told this is that now this misdirective has been put in place, which actually should ensure that in the coming years, uh, European states have more of an idea of where these vital infrastructures are and how they should be protected. As I, as I tried to indicate, um, it's been hard to uh, uh, to come to an agreement within the EU about uh, about well, you could say about anything, uh, but specifically about uh, about cybersecurity um, for the purposes of my talk. Um, and I think some of the um, some of the ideas uh, or some of the facts on the table apply to the EU generally. Um, well, right now, uh, the, the fact that Brexit is occurring is hampering a lot of uh, forward thinking within the EU. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of countries uh, don't know yet uh, where, uh, where everything is heading. Uh, I think also this election year is, is proving quite pivotal for the development of the EU as a whole. And um, it's, uh, uh, I think, I mean, there was a scenario a couple of months ago, I think, in which basically anybody was wondering whether the EU in its current form would still exist in a couple of years. I think, well, uh, this situation is still in motion. Like I said, I'm from the Netherlands. We have our elections next week, so I'll be applying back as soon as I can in order to hopefully promote stability uh, within the EU by casting my own ballot. But uh, it's, uh, these are hectic times, and I think um, it makes it difficult within the context of the EU to think forward about where things are heading. Um, well, there's obviously the fact that uh, most of the economic prosperity, secondly, uh, within the Eurozone has been under immense uh, pressure in the past couple of years, which makes it uh, difficult for, uh, uh, for big expenditures on, on security. Usually the problem with, uh, with security is that it, that it is an afterthought. It is uh, not something that, uh, that is primarily focused on by, by a lot of uh, states. And I think in general, um, which I tried to capture in the third picture, is that everybody within the EU has historically also had their different approaches and different ways of doing things. So they'll uh, usually be all heading in a different direction, even though officially they're still in the same picture. Um, well, like I said, um, it's um, um, the, uh, one of the main starting points for the work that I've been doing it hasn't been for the European Union, but it has been for the European Parliament. Uh, has 
thing in the uh, so-called Snowden revelations. Um, so in 2013, uh, uh, I think everybody probably knows that Edward Snowden uh, uh, released uh, millions of documents to uh, certain journalists who then in turn uh, turned these over. And since then, I think anybody who reads the newspaper will probably be familiar with the term mass surveillance, which is uh, the way that the governments try to collect as much information as possible on their uh, citizens and also citizens from other countries for the purposes of, uh, of maybe using them later for uh, the purposes of uh, fighting of terrorism or any other purpose they might uh, think of. I think one of the main issues with uh, mass surveillance has been historically that uh, it's been very difficult to find out uh, what exactly is being done with the mountains of data that are being uh, gathered. And I think that's the, the main issue that Edward Snowden has been addressing. Um, and, well, since 2013, I think a healthy discussion about the fact that we're being spied on has been started. The, the basic starting point for this as well has been that um, the fact is, if you know that the United States are doing this, I think I, well, I mentioned that earlier, it means that also other states are doing this. So uh, if you know that, uh, that, that the United States is capable of this, maybe other states aren't as advanced as they are, but they're probably within a certain reach. I mean, it's an arms race, so one side will develop a certain capability, and then uh, the others will catch up pretty soon. The fact that with, with software, this is even more obvious, because once, uh, once something is obviously flawed, and the flaw becomes available, then, uh, then it's really easy to, to share this. So the weaknesses are, are very common, and, uh, and all countries are spying. Uh, that's what we know. Some of them are more advanced, some less talked about the, the three big ones uh, who are very good at, uh, at spying. And, uh, uh, but obviously, um, I think there's a famous, uh, a famous security expert called uh, Bruce Schneier, an American one, uh, who basically said, well, um, it's not like governments sat on a table like, like the one we are here and we're discussing like what is the best way we can collect data on our citizens. They were basically thinking, well, if Google and Facebook are collecting this information on everyone anyway, why shouldn't we get a cut of that information? Um, so basically they just called uh, all these technology companies and told them, we need your stuff uh, and give it. And uh, if they couldn't get it voluntarily, they would find a way to get it uh, non-voluntarily. But, uh, but I think that's always a good thing to remember as well, that uh, the main thing that information is being collected on a massive scale and has been and will remain for the next couple of years to, to be the corporations. Um, like I said, uh, the work that I've been doing uh, was started by the European Parliament. They've been one of the most vocal uh, parties uh, opposing mass surveillance within the European context. It's nice when you're in the parliament because you have a bit more leverage uh, in, in the things you do and say. The, the European Union itself is obviously bound by uh, the amount of room they get from the, from the, uh, uh, from the member states that they're, uh, that they're uh, representing. And the European Parliament represents its voters. So it's been very nice working, working for them actually. It's given me a chance to uh, speak a bit more frankly about uh, the things that I see happening in, in cybersecurity. Um, the study that I've been doing was conducted in 2014-15 uh, and, uh, and a bit in 2016. Uh, so it's, uh, it's been quite recently and I've tried to update it for, for today as well. And we've been focusing mainly on if you know uh, the 
fact that mass surveillance has been happening, then uh, what can you actually do about it? Like I said, I, I usually tend to get a bit more technical, um, so I'll try to keep this on a broader level. And basically, um, what what's been what has been discussed within the, the European Parliament for the last couple of years is um, how within the next 10 years um, the need for privacy can be uh, weighed with uh, the needs of security. I mean, this is the general question that I think everybody is looking at. Um, I think right now, within the context of the United States, actually a lot of emphasis is being laid on, uh, on surveillance. Uh, so basically, like, uh, we put the security uh, issues first. And um, the question that we were asked is, are there ways in which uh, the surveillance of European citizens can be uh, reduced and put to a minimum? Um, and in order to do so, um, one of the main things that we also did was uh, try to try to get a broader picture of who the main players within the European context and within the global context are with regards to cyber security, so which parties uh, can have, uh, can provide uh, the infrastructure that we use in order to access the information on the internet and uh, what are the ways in which we can secure what we get off there. policy options in order for the EU to uh, move forward and possibly reduce the effect of mass surveillance. Um, here, I'll go very fast here actually. The, the main thing is that uh, what we did was focus on uh, what are the technical ways in which uh, the internet can actually be, uh, might be redesigned, which what can be done. Um, in a lot of ways, the internet has really changed in the past 30 years. It's been developed and it's been mainly put there. And um, what we're doing right now is mainly, um, well, we use some antivirus, maybe, and you know, we, we do these things that most people know about. Um, but there's not really been a, a very thorough thinking of, okay, is there any way we can change this? This is a phenomenon that in political science is known as path dependency. You've started down a path, uh, which makes it very hard to change anything. But I think right now, actually, we're at the point where uh, we could think about uh, the way that we, uh, we have uh, developed our internet technology. Uh, and if we know that it's inherently unsafe, are there ways which we could uh, redesign parts of it? Um, another part of it, um, which we've been focusing on, that's the, the second one, is the possibility of thinking about uh, actually a European subdivision of the internet. Um, this is a very controversial issue, but it's actually been, uh, 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 it's, and it was mainly, we were discussing it actually because other countries uh, or other entities are thinking about this. So basically right now, as, uh, as it's being said, the World Wide Web is uh, a worldwide uh, network of information. And uh, considering the fact that, uh, for instance, uh, Russia or other countries might be trying to get their own parts of that, um, would you maybe have to think about getting your own little part of the internet where at least you know that everybody you're dealing with is an okay actor. I mean, it would reduce a lot of uh, trouble that we're having with uh, the gigantic amounts of uh, spam, ransomware, uh, technical terms. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a lot of problems that we're having right now with the fact that basically the internet trusts every address which is on the internet. So it really would, your email receives basically any email unless you. Uh, try to catch a lot of the email. Um, so, 
don't you, shouldn't you think about them, uh, ways of uh, getting your own secure recorders of the internet. It's, it's quite a far-fetched thought, but uh, it was interesting to, to look at it. In general, I don't think I'm for it, but uh, it's, it's one of the things that maybe in the future um, we're going to have to think about and go to see happen. Um, the third thing uh, that we uh, looked at was uh, basically, uh, which is a very much more practical issue, is the use of open source in uh, security. The fact that, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of our technology is dependent on uh, a lot of corporations, usually American corporations, who build the operating systems and the software that we all use in the devices that we use. Um, actually, if you uh, promote and aggressively promote the use of open source, it means that Easily, uh, uh, you can more easily become independent of these larger parties, and also the uh, the security implications of that obviously are that you can actually see what's happening within the machines that you operate. I think it's by now a pretty common phenomenon that we're all looking at our smartphone and thinking like, what does this thing know about me? I think one of the more potent images of the, the several films that have been made about Edward Snowden has been the fact that uh, he puts his uh, telephone not only turns it off, but he also puts it in the freezer in order to make sure that uh, actually you can't, uh, he can't be overheard. And uh, I think, yeah, and then the microwave, uh, he put it in as well. Yeah. <laughs> That tells us something about the way that our technology is, uh, is looking back at us. Um, and one of the main advantages of open source is that um, you know what's happening inside there. So that's a nice thing. I mean, like I said, I'm not a technical guy, so I don't know what, what the hell is happening, even if it's open source. But luckily, there's other uh, people who are technical and who can then look into uh, to this uh, software. Um, and the, the final part that we were looking at was uh, the fact that end-to-end uh, -end user encryption, um, which I think has become a bit more uh, a bit more prominent, um, we were looking at in the fact that this should be used more often. And luckily, uh, WhatsApp listened to us. So last year, uh, all messages that you sent via WhatsApp get encrypted and then decrypted on the device. So WhatsApp cannot look into your messages anymore. That is the basic principle of end-to-end -end encryption. It means that if I have my smartphone and I send a message to Sylvia, uh, only she can read it, not anybody else. Uh, and it, yeah, it seems pretty logical, but uh, it wasn't really in the interest of a lot of companies government so far to implement this uh, because it takes a lot of work and maybe that's one problem. Uh, the data becomes a bit more problematic to transport. But obviously the main problem for all these parties was that they couldn't read your messages anymore. So uh, that's why they didn't do it a lot of times. Now you see that actually WhatsApp has implemented this uh, security a lot more. Apple has implemented it. So I think we're looking at a, a future in which this is happening more, and I think it's, uh, it's about time. Um, uh, so if we look at uh, then um, how we, for the, for the European Parliament, uh, I don't think I'll go to, into too many details actually because this, yeah, this gets very technical. But um, the, main, the main issue is that we try to sketch ways forward for European institutions by mainly, uh, so either you work very basically at the fundamentals of, uh, of things that can be fixed quite easily. Um, so like you uh, promote open source, promote 
end-to-end -end encryption and things like that I was talking about. This is basically uh, looking at uh, what's on the market right now and try to improve on that. Um, then a second scenario which we sketched was to innovate, which is in the right bottom corner, which means um, I think a lot more can be done, especially from a European perspective, to stimulate uh, research and development on a lot of ways in which uh, mass surveillance can be undercut, and a lot of ways in which uh, the, uh, the internet as a whole can become a lot safer. So this is the type of approach in which um, it's, it's sort of a, a, a commons problem in the internet. Like it's, it's, it's a, um, the internet has been built for everyone to use it, but it has a lot of open weaknesses. And it's not in any individual state or individual company's advantage to fix them, but there is a, a general urgency to fix a lot of these problems. So, uh, how do you do that then? Well, our approach within this research was to say, well then, uh, probably as the European Union, at least you have some cloud, and you have a very specific structure because of these member states that are working together in one whole. Um, so, you basically, you don't really have a, a really big national security interest that governs them all. So, the European Union would actually be an interesting starting point in trying to improve the security of a lot of the infrastructure of the, of the internet. Um, so we, um, we proposed some specific uh, technical things that I want to talk about. Uh, the third scenario was actually would be uh, to go a bit further than, than just uh, improve on things that are already there and try to look at, uh, um, at actually being more radical, uh, demanding of companies that they perform according to the certain guidelines that you have, uh, basically making making life a bit more complicated for a lot of people in order to make sure that uh, uh, the technology uh, that comes into your country uh, actually um, uh, is secure and safe to use uh, for everyone. So I like, uh, I like the way that uh, I personally uh, like uh, being a bit more strict, perhaps, um, towards uh, companies. So we uh, suggested implementing a certain type of baselines, uh, implementing also uh, uh, European guidelines for how uh, software should be uh, checked for uh, if it's safe, and maybe even looking at uh, certification schemes. And as I mentioned earlier, this idea of uh, creating certain safe corners where uh, you know who's doing what on, on this internet. <coughs> so, um, I think we're all getting pretty warm, and uh, I'm, I'm talking a lot, which, which isn't a good thing, so I've tried to keep it short. Um, so, looking at the future, uh, well, like I said, end-to-end uh, -end encryption has, has come off uh, quite well in the past couple of years. Uh, the funding of Open Start is actually uh, being very hesitant. Uh, but I think in general, uh, a lot of people have, uh, have discovered that Snowden is, is on to something, uh, in the sense that um, actually weakening Weakening the security for certain purposes means that we're weakening the system as a whole, which is the main thing that, uh, that Snowden uh, kept warning, keeps warning us about, actually. Um, and um, I think, in general, communication is uh, obviously, I mean, we keep finding new ways uh, to communicate with one another. With one another. And we're also increasingly uh, connecting a lot of devices. I think in a couple of years our cars will be talking to the real roads, or, uh, or, or the roads, I mean, actually the train cars will be speaking to the railroad. Um, we're putting sensors into everything around us. 
So the security issues are becoming even bigger. So called uh, Internet of Things is, uh, is a hugely problematic uh, uh, development with regards to security. I mean, it's supposed to make our life better. I'm quite skeptical about uh, why my water cooker would need to be on the internet as it is, but uh, apparently, according to the manufacturers, this, this is a really urgent development. Um, so uh, I guess I'll be buying one of those, but uh, nobody actually knows who updates uh, the software on these devices. Uh, is, am I responsible as the consumer? Is uh, the software uh, developer uh, responsible, the manufacturer? And nobody actually knows. So it's being expected that within five years we'll have about 50 billion of these devices operating worldwide and nobody really knows uh, who's responsible for security in these. Um, and I think uh, actually in the second half of 2016 there was a very big attack on, uh, on the main infrastructure of the internet uh, which was being uh, done by Internet of Things devices. Um, so we're actually already seeing the problems of this uh, occur. I mean, we, we were writing about this, like I said, in 2015 and 16. You can actually immediately see these problems in practice. So it's, uh, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a bit ironic. <laughs>